Good morning um, and good afternoon. Um, webinar is basically going to cover uh, 5G and how it started in release 15 and what we're seeing as we move on to release 16, which is currently going on, um, and release 17, which is coming up, what the features are, what the test ch testing challenges is. Uh, primarily, uh, what I want to get out of this at the end is make sure that everybody on the call is able to have some sort of idea about, uh, one, first of all, the 5G landscape, you know, what it looks like right now what are the new features coming in, as well as what are the testing challenges. And uh, again, there'll be questions, answered at the end. Um, hopefully we'll have time for that. If there is no time, I'll be happy to take them offline. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, so, so pretty much um, on the 5G side, the global 5G landscape, right? If you look at it right now, um, we've had about uh, roughly about 381 uh, operators who have launched so far in, in a total of 123 countries. So if you remember, the first 5G launch in, in North America happened in December of uh, 2018. Um, and in the first half of 2019, um, you know, the remaining three operators had, had launched 5G. Um, and shortly thereafter, we had launches in Korea, um, followed by in Europe, uh, in Australia. So what we're seeing over here is that the, the 5G deployment is, is going on um, at a very fast pace. Um, you can see over here, there are color coded with respect to what the 5G launches have been uh, in what year and what they are forecast in the future. So, so pretty much uh, almost uh, we have about uh, I would say 70 different commercial networks right now across uh, four, 40 different countries, right? And when it comes to 381 operators, those are people who are running trials and seeing 5G evaluations to see what's coming in. So as you can see, uh, pretty much uh, launching started in 2000, December 2018. Uh, you know, we're less, probably a year and a half after that, and we can see how, back, how, how widely that is penetrating, right? So moving on, uh, that's on the network side on how the deployment is. Um, if we look at, at the spectrum, you know, like what is the spectrum that's being used, right? So what spectrum is, is, is primarily classified into um, low band, mid band, uh, and high band spectrum, right? So low band is considered spectrum that is one gigahertz and below. Uh, mid, mid band will be one gigahertz all the way up to 7.125 gigahertz. And then, you know, above that, right now, millimeter wave, you know, you can go anywhere from uh, 24.25 gigahertz to 52.6 gigahertz to be exact. So if you look at the, the overall market, if I focus mainly on the North American market, I would say the major, major deployment started on FR2, which is called frequency range two or millimeter wave. Um, and uh, there was here and there, you know, a little bit of FR1 deployment, you know, with respect to 600 megahertz, um, 2.5 gigahertz from, from some of the operators. Uh, but if you look at it worldwide, uh, you, can, you can see that I, I would say majority and bulk of the deployment has been on FR1, right? Um, FR2 is picking up. Um, there are several reasons for that. You know, I mean, one one of them could be the fact that though that spectrum is not available in other parts of the world, uh, it's a good thing it's available in in the North American market, in the Japanese market, in the Korean market. We do have these millimeter wave deployment. But as you can see over here um, on this chart, it's showing you that the main band that has been there out for deployment has been the primary band, and the sweet spot we are at somewhere between 2.5 to 3.5 gigahertz that gives you the right amount of coverage um, as well as it gives you the right um, uh, you know amount amount of capacity and throughput that you can get out of those those wider channels right so each of these different bands would would probably have you know the high band would have a different use case versus the mid band and the low band um, and, and things that have moved forward right and you know as, as you as you know there are more auctions happening there was a recent auction that happened about for 37, 39, and 47 gigahertz that just closed um, in March of this year. There was a 28 gigahertz auction that happened uh, prior to that. So um, there is, and then there's uh, a 3.5 gigahertz auction that's being planned uh, by FCC uh, sometime um, mid of this year, right? So that's, that's, that's in works. So spectrum wide, you know, 5G caters to a lot more spectrum than what's being catered in 4G timeframe. Now, on the device side, what's what's interesting to note on the device side is what this this uh, is again taken from GSA uh, editorial, and what it's primarily showing us on the left chart over here is showing us the growth of 5G devices, right, starting in 2019, um, going all the way as of last month. So you can see that this is a steady growth 
starting from these are the number of devices that have been announced, right? So, I mean, the number of devices announced can be uh, the, some of those devices um, are commercial devices, and some of those devices have not been commercialized, right? So, altogether, there are about 280 devices as of mid of April that you can see, right? And um, the first announcements have started happening sometime in 2000. Uh, late 2017, early 2018, around the MWC time frame. But there, there have been a lot of devices uh, that have been announced. Um, a lot of them have been commercialized. But the, the key thing to note over here when we compare this to 4G is the form factor, right? So the, the form factor is a lot more, has a lot more variance than the form factor that we had in 4G. I mean, 4G, we had some CPEs, we had some IoT devices. Um, and then, you know, obviously we have the traditional handsets, laptops, but as we move on to 5G, it's opening doors to a lot more different use cases. So what we see in the top, uh, sorry, the bottom left uh, corner over here shows you the 5G devices by the form factors, right? So it shows that so far out of the 280 devices that have been announced, about 38% of those, those devices are, are phones. Um, and then right followed by that are CPEs, about 28%. And then you have modules, laptops. Uh, you will have a, in the others category, which is about 7% right now, that is going to increase. You know, you could have um, robots over there. You could have uh, some sort of head-mounted displays. You could have AR, VR gateways. Um, you could have vending machines. So the other factor is going to grow with time, right? Um, and then from a frequency range perspective, as you can see, that the, the way the devices have been announced so far um, is pretty much the fact that uh, it shows you what, what is the frequency range is supported by these 280 devices. So as, as you can see, now these 280 devices can be some sort of a different form factor, uh, but it could, it could be different SKUs of the same kind of device that's targeting different regions. So keep that, keep that in mind, right? You could have a device working in, uh, meant for the Chinese market, but the same model may be meant for the US market, right? So uh, the key thing to note over here is there are devices the millimeter wave, the number of devices supporting FR2 is it's, it's certainly um, less than half of what um, have been announced to support FR1. But there are operators out there who are mandating FR2 support on their uh, devices. And then there are operators who are supporting both FR1 and FR2, and some may have uh, dominance towards FR1. So again, the key, key takeaway from this is the, the networks are expanding, 5G investment is continuing, the number of devices is, uh, you know, as you can see the, the chart, it's, it's growing at a very, very steady, steady. It's not asymptotic. It's going at a very steady rate over here. Alrighty. Um, so moving on, if we go on into the 3GPP timeline, so if, if you look at where 5G all started, right? So 5G pretty much um, started with what we call phase one or which is release 15, right? So the work on release 15 in 3GPP, which is uh, certainly a body that creates uh, specifications, the work for release 15 started actually in June of 2016. And the work actually finished um, almost three years after that in June of 2019 was the time frame when um, when this um, finished pretty much. So what we can see over here is release 15, late 2017, it started, there was a freeze, which is the freeze of, of the basic protocol set. And then then an ASN.1 freeze that happened sometime um, in end of quarter one around March of 2018. Uh, but the key thing to note is release 15 is, the phase one has been pretty big. There are different network deployments. There is what we call the, the non standalone mode whereby you have an LT anchor tied to uh, and the 5G and R, and then you have the standalone mode, which came later on, which we call option two. Um, and that uh, got completed uh, much later on, sometime in um, September of 2018 over here. And then there was work happening on other network deployment options, uh, which I won't get into the details, but they were like option five, option four, uh, option seven. Uh, those were kind of pu pushed out, but there was a delay, uh, roughly about three months over here, but again, Phase one was completed, uh, and and the main thing over here it was pretty much you know when, when we look at these different stages over here you know stage one is pre pretty much referring to your service service description from the service user end point of view right and then stage two is uh, you know an abstract of the architecture of different function elements 
um, and stage three is whereby you know you have your protocols that are going between different interfaces. So that's where the stages come into play. But the key thing to note is ASM.1 is when you, where you have the protocol and all the pieces in place. Um, now these are the, the basic, these are the test specification, these are more of the core core specification that we're talking about, right? So again, phase one has been completed and now we're getting into phase two, right? So what what is phase two? So what this chart is showing you over here, we talked about release 15 getting completed in, in um, September of 2019 and now we're talking about release 16 and 17, right? So release 16 pretty much started, uh, the work on release 16 started sometime, I would say in September of uh, 2019. Um, you know, it was happening in parallel to release 15 work. Um, and then there are different stages we talk about, right? So we have stage two, stage three, uh, and then the ASN.1. Um, stage three is pretty much, you know, you have all your protocol stuff in place. Uh, release 16 ASN.1 is whereby everything has been determined uh, pretty much. Uh, and then RAN4 that you're seeing over here, the RAN4 is planned to be completed sometime in December of 2019, right? So, uh, the 20, sorry, December of 2021. Uh, so basically what we're showing over here, RAN4 pretty much is whereby you're looking at uh, the different performances, right? That That's what RAN4 is gonna be focusing on the testing methodologies as well, right? So if you look at it, you know, release 16 stage three freeze, uh, it got shifted by three months, right? So it's it's now normally um, this this got shifted. This was supposed to be finishing uh, sometime in March of 2020, but the release 16 stage three got delayed by three months. But however, the end date for ASN.1 freeze that did not get delayed. But now so there's an overlap between what's happening in uh, stage three as well as ASN.1. So Primarily June uh, next month, we expect um, ASN.1 as well as the stage three to be completed, right? Um, and again, uh, as I said, stage three is whereby, you know, you make sure that the basic functionality and protocols, uh, the, the interaction between the different interfaces or the physical elements are, are, are working fine, right? So that's the point. Now RAN4 is supposed to complete somewhere in December, 2021. And that's what the current timeline is, right? So that's, um, in a nutshell, what the timeline for release 16 is. On release 17 front, what's happening in release 17 is, okay, work has already started. The the, the, the the area we're in right now, the phase we're in right now, stage one is where we are defining the content of release 17, what is gonna be in, there's gonna be study items that are going on, uh, there's gonna be technical reports coming out of it, but what we're looking at is what is the content definition. So we do have features um, in release 17, right? Um, and as you can see, those uh, pretty much 20, December of 2019 um, was the time frame when the content definition got completed. So for release 17, they were kind of working more on the stage two part of it. Um, and then the completion date that is currently targeted uh, for release 17 ASN.1 freeze is December of 2021. So. Uh, the the stage three freeze, whereby your protocols freeze, uh, your interface uh, information is there. That is trying to that is planned to be free, freezing in September of 2021, and ASN.1 freeze is going to be happening sometime in December of 2021. Um, and then the physical layer stuff, which is what we call um, RAN1, that freeze is going to be happening in June of 2021. So a lot of stuff coming in in 2021, and then again you have your RAN4 which is your um, RF performance that is kind of targeted sometime in 2022. Uh, so uh, again, now release 18, as I said, you know, the, the December 2019 was when we finished the content definition for release 17. December of 2021 of this year is when it's targeted to have the content definition for release 18. So this gives you a high level overview of how the releases, you know, as you can see, uh, completion, it's, pretty much a year apart, a year, maybe I would say about 15 months apart between release 16, uh, release 17, release 17, and release 18, right? That's roughly anywhere from 12 months to 15 months. So, so that is the, the high level picture with respect to how things are unfolding on 3GPP between release 15, 16, and 17. Okay, um, moving on. Uh, we're gonna get into the different features, right? What what are the different 
features, the verticals that we need to look at with respect to uh, TGPP. Uh, as you know, there were there were different features, or there were I would say there, there were limited number of features um, that were there in release uh, 15. But as we move on, uh, release 15 was primarily focusing on one thing, which was high throughput, high throughput, and high throughput, extreme mobile broadband. LTE was also about high throughput. Release 15, the use case was extreme mobile broadband, high data rates, right? But as we move on into release 16 and release 17, we're we're trying to dividing these different uh, basically use cases by different verticals, right? So the, the the four main verticals are, I would say three main verticals we have are, one of them is industrial IoT, um, and then we have some other verticals which I'm gonna talk about. Uh, improvements happening on network deployment and automation. Um, and last but not the least, we have what we call 5G uh, device enhancement, right? So as you can see, pretty much release 16, you know, was was focusing on mainly on enhanced mobile broadband. But as we move on to release 17, there are incre incrementals happening and, you know, we are working on better um, performances, better KPIs, better spectral efficiency that we can get. A lot of stuff that we were not able to accomplish in release 15 would be accomplished in release 16 uh, moving on. So this this shows you a high level overview of the different features that are coming in and I'm gonna go into some of these features that, that I think um, is important or are important. So from release 16 perspective, you have the, the new radio in unlicensed band, you have private networks, um, there is a uh, vehicle to communication. So CV2X is the other vertical I'm talking about. Uh, we'll, we'll dig in a little bit into the CV2X part. Uh, as well as on network deployment side, we have in network slicing phase two. Phase one happens in release 15, not fully used because we don't have the 5G core completely implemented by, by the operators, but then we, there is this network slicing phase two. Um, and then device enhancement, right? We can't forget that, you know, we have a device that is catering to so many different technologies, so many different um, complex antenna techniques, um, it's gonna have a power drain on the battery, right? So what enhancement can we make? How can we make the devices more efficient? So those are some of the items in release 16. Um, release 17 will introduce, go one step further, right? And they will talk further, uh, you know, refine these different, uh, you know, feature set, uh, that, that can improve the security, the network service management, um, and, and the whole integrity of the 5G system, right? And you will look at things like NR Lite, which I'll talk about, side link enhancement, and then again, network slicing phase three, and then other items like, you know, enhanced MIMO uh, using, uh, you know, less complex NR Lite devices just for consumer IoT. So, so if key thing to note over here is in release 15, we started with only one use case which is enhanced mobile broadband, but that use case has kind of basically transcended into four different areas, and those four different verticals are gonna continue release 16 as well as release 17. All right, so um, moving on with respect to this, let's talk about some of these features. So one of the more important feature that I wanna mention um, over here is what we call spectrum sharing. Um, and unlicensed band in 5G new radio. So if you remember, there were features in LTE like LAA, license assisted access, LTU, which was LTE and licensed band using the uni bands. Um, and then we had ELA, and there's so many of those features that really wanted to use this unlicensed band. Now, this is a great time to now use unlicensed band in 5G. 5G, the frame structure has changed from 4G. 5G has a lot of stuff built into it that makes it a lot more suitable than 4G. You know, things like, having, um, you know, sh shorter ACNAC time frame, right? That, that, that makes it easier of deploying unlicensed band, um, you know, outdoors as well. So, so pretty much uh, this is gonna be a release 16 feature. As you know, five, it's gonna go anywhere from five uh, gigahertz all the way to 7.125 gigahertz, those, that's, that's unlicensed band to begin with. Uh, but then there is some work happening on in release 17, which looks at how do we apply uh, different waveforms and different multiple access techniques to higher frequencies that go higher than 52.6. So as you know, between 64 to 71 gigahertz, uh, that's about 17 gigahertz of uh, unlicensed band. That, that's uh, license, licenses, um, you know, basically license uh, are very, frequencies are very difficult to 
uh, and more expensive to get, right? But we have 14 gigahertz of license, unlicensed span that's available between 64 to 71 gigahertz. So there'll be certainly use of that. I know 802.11.80 has used licenses basically in around 60 gigahertz frequency range, but now this is a chance for us to use unlicensed band between 64 to 71 for cellular purposes. But again, for, for our purpose on this page, we're looking at mainly for um, an, an unlicensed band in five gigahertz to 7.125 gigahertz. Again, it, it's gonna vary because in some areas like Japan or Europe, they, they may have, um, certain restrictions um, that are not there in, in other regions of the world. So mainly there are, um, there's gonna be some changes uh, to uh, the frame structure. We need to make sure that we can coexist properly with LTE. We can coexist properly with Wi-Fi. Uh, we implement listen before talk feature, which was there in LAA. Uh, but there are primarily gonna be five different deployments that we're looking at right now. So scenario A is a deployment whereby you have carrier aggregation between a licensed band, which is gonna be your primary NR cell, and an unlicensed band, which is your secondary cell or NR unlicensed, right? In this case, you know, you could have the, your NRU um, secondary cell could have both downlink and uplink, or it could have downlink only as well. Um, and then your primary cell is the one that's gonna be connected to your 5G core. Now that's one example. Scenario B is gonna be dual connectivity, right? So we, 5G and R, NSA, it's all about dual connectivity, you know, multi different radio access technologies, um, you know, communicating. Uh, so in this, in this case, what, what's gonna happen, you will have a licensed P cell, uh, which could be LTE, right? And then you could have uh, an R cell, which could be your uh, S cell, right? So in this scenario, your LTE P cell is connected to your EPC, uh, and then your, uh, your P cell pretty much is connected uh, to your 5G core network, right? So that's scenario B. And in scenario C, that is basically more of a greenfield situation, just like putting in Wi-Fi access points. You know, you will have your NRU and that's your new radio uh, unlicensed. That radio will be connected to your 5G core directly. So it's just easy deployment. It's just like the way you have it with uh, some sort of a Wi-Fi access pointer. So it's gonna be directly competing with 802.11 AD and 802.11 AY. And then you have other scenarios like uh, scenario D, which in this case you have a standalone NR cell in unlicensed band, right? And, and then you have uplink in licensed band. So your downlink um, is gonna be unlicensed band, but your uplink is gonna be in unlicensed band, right? Uh, and this scenario also you have your NR uh, unlicensed uh, this station is going to be connected to your 5G core. So 5G core is a requirement for that. Uh, and then you have scenario E. In this scenario E, you have dual connectivity between a license band uh, as well as, and so you have an, an license NR band and then you have an unlicensed NR band. And in this case, your P cell is connected to your 5G, 5G core network, right? So, so there are different deployment schemes uh, that's being looked at, but this is again focusing on release 16 uh, for unlicensed band, which I think it's, it's gonna be a very important feature. Uh, operators would, would have to jump on it for the fact that you know it's the free, free spectrum and nobody says no no to free spectrum right so that's uh, more on the unlicensed side um the other feature that i wanted to talk about that's going to be very important is what we called iab or it's called integrated access and backhaul so the function the, the primary goal of iab is is to improve capacity you know, improve capacity by supporting networks, you know, with a high density of access points in areas, you know, where you, whereby you don't have fiber available, right? Uh, so again, fiber can be expensive to, to implement as well as maintain. Um, and then you are also going to be able to improve the coverage by extending the range of wireless network, right? So it's not only having fiber in, not having fiber in place, but also be able to extend. You can easily deploy these um, wireless nodes uh, but providing coverage for, you know, isolated gaps, right? So you could have a UE in a building or you can have an access point providing coverage to UE with access point being connected, you know, wirelessly to some. So you have you have the concept of a donors, donor node as well as you have a concept of an IAB node. So a donor node is pretty much the one that's going to be providing um, the main uh, signal, right? And And as you can see, you can have um, the donor node, uh, again, it's, it's basically a separation of, uh, you know, you have your CUs, which is your centralized unit and your distributed unit, right? So 
in case of release 15, we had this concept of, you know, the PDCP uh, split. Uh, you had different ways of splitting. You know, you could have your physical Mac uh, layer um, on, on one, in, in basically um, in your DU, and then you could have your RLC, PDCP, and higher layers in your CU. That way you can have a sort of a distributed network, right? So what we're doing over here is we are able to uh, connect different nodes, different base stations, or G node Bs together, right? So you can form a sort of a mesh network. Um, and then you, um, and then eventually one of those nodes are, so the node, the subsequent child node don't have to communicate to the core directly. They can con uh, communicate to a, a donor node that is being shown over here, right? But the UE can communicate with each of these nodes, can communicate with the child node or it can communicate um, with the parent node as well. So that, that gives us a lot of flexibility of quicker deployment um, in, in high dense uh, areas, pretty much, right? So I mean, there are different features we're looking at, you know, this multi-hop backhauling, you know, for FR1 as well as FR2. <clears throat> but the link between um, the nodes is primarily going to be millimeter wave link, FR2 link, because we need to have that high capacity, uh, high bandwidth, but it's going to be over shorter distance, you know, between between the different nodes, right? Um, but the, the, there, there are challenges. Uh, there has to be very much uh, key synchronization across this whole topology. Uh, we should be able to operate, you know, in sort of a dual connectivity uh, mode with UE as well as IAB nodes. So uh, it, it, it's challenging, but I think it, it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, efficient way of using our spectrum, not only for the air interface between the UE and the GNOD, but between GNOD Bs and GNOD Bs, similar to what we had the X2 interface. So we have the XN interface um, in case of 5G. All right, so this is more on uh, integrated access and backhaul. Now we'll move on to the other vertical that we're talking about, which is IoT, right? So this is it's very important um, in the sense that URLLC, what stands uh, for ultra-reliable low-latency communications and how they're used in industrial IoT. So there have to be several changes um, that are pretty much made. You know, in, in case of release 15, if you remember, the basic support for URLLC was introduced by having, you know, flexible uh, slots, uh, having different timing, different subcarrier spacing. You know, you know, as you have tighter requirements, you know, you can have shorter latency in the order of half uh, to one milliseconds. Um, you know, you can have 15 kilohertz subcarrier spacing all the way up to, uh, for FR1, you can have 15, 30, uh, or 60, and in case of FR2, you can have 60, uh, 120 to 240. But as your subcarrier spacing increases, your 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 TTI, your ti transmit time interval reduces, right? So you can send a lot of data in a much shorter time frame, right? And as you know, uh, in 5G and out of our frame structure, we uh, we don't transmit per frame, but we are able to transmit on the order of the OFDM symbol, which is a big plus for 5G and our frame structure, right? So some of the items, you know that is gonna be helping us uh, with URL LC is, as I said, is the lower latency for supporting the different subcarrier spacing, shorter transmission time intervals. Um, you know, we have what we call mini slots, whereby you slot, you you are, you don't have to use all the, you know, the 14 OFDM symbols, uh, but you can, slot, you can group and transmit into a series of different, less than 14 OFDM symbols, right? And then you can also do, PDCCH monitoring, um, and then you can do a lot of something called what we call PDCP duplication, right? So there is going to be enhancement there, as we talked about different enhancements over here. So there's enhancement, you know, on PDCCH, whereby we are able to configure different downlink control information, different sizes. So there are certain sizes that are used in case of 5G release 15, but that has been increased. You can configure. Uh, the DCI information for um, URL LC, um, that's a big plus, um, as well as you have some uplink share channel enhancement, right? Uh, just like you have PDSCH, you had on the uplink side also there enhancement happening. Uh, we're supporting what we call cross um, slot boundary scheduling um, for both dynamic uh, PUSCH grant and configured PUSCH grant, right? And then there's also talks about, uh, you know, doing inter-UE prioritization that was shown over here, basically 
uh, it's it's your uplink preemption by allowing the genome to be to interrupt data transmission, you know, from one user uh, to accommodate another user uh, that has a higher priority data. So you can pretty much uh, trigger which users are allowed to transmit data depending on what the priority of that specific um, transmission is, right? And then we have other items like, you know, enhanced uplink um, grant-free transmission. That means you don't have to wait for grant. You can have sort of an asynchronous uh, transmission. Um, and then you could also have grant, configured grant enhancements also, right? So, so pretty much four different areas, uh, a lot on the physical layer side are going to make this URL LC and industrial IoT enhancements uh, possible. Right, so moving on, um, on to other areas, if you look at is cellular VTX, which was part of the other verticals, right? So cellular VTX is divided into three different phases. So we had what we call phase one. Phase one was release 14, right? And release 14 was pretty much looking at, you know, PC5 interface. Uh, it talked about uh, the mode four operation that's defined by 5GAA. Uh, pretty much there were very basic, you know, safety use cases, you know, with respect to what the requirements are. And again, it was mainly on, on release 14, right? So we had the devices would know um, there is some sort of a, provide any kind of collision warning. Um, pretty much of, of that, that's what it was pretty much on in phase one part. And then when we came to phase two, uh, in release 15, that introduced a number of new features in SideLink, like, you know, carrier aggregation, high modulation, um, latency reduction. Uh, so all these enhanced features in 3GPP V2X phase two were based on LTE. Uh, that was, and then required coexistence with release 14 UE, you know, in the same same kind of resource pool. So I don't expect release 15, uh, basically V2X to be very widely deployed. Uh, I think the big pick for release uh, for for v two x is going to be in phase three um, and then there is you know concept of uh, as you can see in in, in phase two uh, the fa the features were primarily based on high throughput you know EMBB. there was nothing really specific to v two x you know whereby you're actually using the side link right which is your pc five interface so what release sixteen is doing right now is introducing um, and our V2X features using sidling and also using the low latency functions, you know, we having that we talked about for, uh, you know, industrial IoT. So it's kind of interconnected over here, um, if I may say so. And, and what, what the key thing that you will be looking at over here is the different areas that we're, we're looking at. Um, you know, you, you have areas of, you know, vehicles uh, platooning. This is mainly enabling devices and or vehicles to dynamically form a group uh, traveling together. Um, so all the divide, all the cars or all the vehicles in that group would receive the data from a leading vehicle, right? It's sort of a, similar to what I talked about IAB, but you have one one group of uh, one group, and you have multiple vehicles in it, and one vehicle providing information to all the other vehicles. And then you have extended sensors, which enables the exchange of you know uh, raw or processed data gathered through local sensors. Um, and then we have advanced driving, which uh, helps with semi-automated you know, or fully automated driving. Um, you know, you have, uh, you could have a longer distance between the vehicles as well. And then last but not the least is what we call, we have the remote driving, right? Which is truly autonomous, you have a remote driver, you have some sort of a V2X application that's gonna, you know, remotely control control that vehicle. So those are the, the, the three different phases of cellular V2X. As I said, uh, we saw some items in release 14. We don't expect uh, release 15, um, specifically for sidling purpose to take uh, popularity, uh, but I think the dominance is gonna be coming uh, for features that are being deployed uh, in release 16 for 5G NR based V2X. All right, um, now the other item that we'd like to talk about is what we call satellite services, right? So 5G V2X, again, this is a release 17 feature. Um, Satellite access, as we move from 5G V2X, which was release 16, now on to release 17, which is satellite access in 5G, right? So um, the objective over here is there are different use cases that, are, that I've mentioned over here, like roaming between terrestrial networks, you know, and satellite networks, and Internet of Things, uh, and, and so on and so forth, right? So the key idea over here is what we're seeing is uh, 
the device, you could have a device uh, and that device would be able to communicate, can form a sort of a relay. And, and when it, it forms a relay, it's able to communicate with other devices. So you can have device to device communication. Um, so you could have one device that will be talking to a satellite, uh, have satellite access, but that device would also be acting as a node that it can distribute services to other devices in that geographical area. So there are the different ways of doing, looking at it. You could have a sort of a ship, for instance, that is traveling, it's on land, and all of a sudden from land, it, it goes on to uh, the sea, uh, but it still has to talk with the core network. So your satellite link would be communicating with, with the core network, right? Um, so there are challenges over here. Obviously, you want to minimize uh, the latency between your, your device that is communicating directly with, with your satellite services. So that's um, an area that we need to look at. Is, it's going to be picking up in, in release 17 um, as we uh, take a look at it. And, and then um, other items that we will be looking at is, is primarily, you know, what, what sort of uh, changes in architecture are, are going to be present, you know, for this sort of non-terrestrial network. You know, we, you can look at the feeder link here, um, or which is a backhaul. It's, it's terminating in some sort of a ground-based gateway that is connected to the 5G core. So that's more on the satellite. Um, I don't see much happening. Uh, Maybe I would say maybe in the next two to three years. Again, this it will have a very good deployment into disaster areas, uh, also with public safety networks. All right, so let's let's move on to the next part on what we call NR light. So NR light, as you can see on top over here, is in LTE we had the concept of narrowband IoT category M1 or what we call you know enhanced machine type communications. Uh, that's at the lower spectrum. There are less complex devices, very low throughput devices, high battery life, um, and very low cost and low data rates, right? So those those were the key parameters. But if you look at the color coding over here, um, and then you have the other set of devices that are doing HCC uh, with 2x2 two two MIMO for FR2, those are really enhanced mobile broadband. And then you have some low latency devices also, but those are full NR. Now this NR light is going to be something in the middle. It's a, it's it's a, a sort of you can look at it. Uh, it's sort of a, a, a basically a, a mix, you know, a, a balance between the low power wide area devices, which were in LTE, versus the full devices, right? So, and examples of these devices could be your wearables, smartwatches, you know, health services, medical monitoring, which don't really require a lot of uh, you know throughput. Um, they may require decent coverage, but very low cost, uh, very high battery life. So uh, this spider chart over here is showing you the different KPIs like latency, reliability, uh, data rate, and tells you like if you take an example, the enhanced mobile broadband, which is green over here, that requires you to have, the requirement is to have very high throughput over here, obviously, uh, somewhat low latency. But if you look at the gray portion in here, that is striking a balance across all of these KPIs. So we don't want to have really long battery life, but it should be somewhere in the middle. So it's somewhere in the middle between low power wide area IoT as well as uh, what we call uh, full new radio. All right, so that is more on the NR light side. Uh, again, the requirements, there could be different requirements over here uh, for NR light. Um, and the main thing is gonna be the device complexity. Uh, you know, we wanna have new device, lower cost, lower complexity, device size, have a lower, smaller form factor and deployment scenarios whereby it should be able to deploy both in FR1, FR2, FTD, and TDD, right? So those are some of the items. And then we have other additional features um, that I wanna mention over here um, that are coming in that I haven't gone into details, but some of them are basically, you know, supporting higher than 52.6 gigahertz frequency, right? As you know, to support those, we are gonna need new waveforms. Um, the current OFDMA may not work. It may be uh, introduction of new numerology, um, different subcarrier spacing, um, because there could be there are a lot of propagation issues uh, that are associated with high high uh, frequency transmission. Um, other items that are coming in are you know mobility enhancement. How quickly can we do handovers in future between FR2 devices or FR1 and FR2 devices? Those are also going to be playing a key role. 
Um, and then, you know, we have enhanced DSS. DSS means dynamic spectrum sharing. Um, that is a very, very important feature in release 15, moving on to release 16. That, that's whereby operators don't have to wait for frequency to be uh, reformed. Uh, use LTE bands in the same location, both frequency and time domain with 5G and R. So enhancement happening with DSS is on the PDSCH, whereby they're looking at using uh, some symbols in the past were reserved uh, for LTE uh, and could not be used for NR. So they're kind of going go from eight symbols they could use in the past to 10 symbols. So there are some changes happening here. Um, NR positioning, you know, going from meters accuracy to centimeter accuracy. Uh, MIMO enhancement, Huey power saving is mainly supporting, you know, RRC um, inactive mode, which is a new mode that was added in 5G. So those kind of things are some other features which I don't have time to go into detail about that would be uh, happening in release 16 and release 17. So moving on, let's, now we have talked about 5G uh, features, release 16, release 17 features starting release 15. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the testing challenges, right? So what are the challenges we have and what are the solutions for those challenges? So first of all, if you look at it, you know, the devices of today uh, have to be really, really complex. They have to support FR1, they have to support millimeter wave, they have to support different deployment options like NSA and SA. Uh, and supporting on top of that, they will have to support different radioactive technologies, right? LTE, 3G, a uh, lot of places still has 2G, 4G and 5G, those are there supporting different bandwidths, different subcarrier spacing, you know, uh, different, when supporting FR2 and FR1, you could have a, a whole different sort of uh, implementation on your transceivers on what sort of, uh, you know, um, techniques are you using. Are you using hybrid beam forming? Because you have to use some sort of beam forming per millimeter wave so you can focus your energy and kind of offset, um, kind of offset the, the propagation loss. So, Again, Enritsu, what we're showing over here is um, the Enritsu 5G communication tester, which is MT8000, um, and it can be used as devices, chipsets, RF front ends, uh, and again, it's, it's one box tester that will do your RF testing, your protocol testing, um, as well as your application level testing. So those are some of the challenges. So we need to have a system, a test system that's able to cater to each of these changing in technology. So we don't need to have a new system when it comes to release 17. You want to make sure that the system that's there, the call box that is being used is scalable to go from release 15 to release 17 and beyond with limited hardware changes. All right, um, other challenges that we see in 5G is new power classes, right? So we have traditionally we have been testing power class three. Um, you know, which goes all the way up to 43 dBm as the maximum EIRP. But as we go into the different power classes, like power class one, for instance, which is kind of mainly on CTEs, right? So those have a much higher super, uh, power requirement, right? As you can see, power class one across the different FR2 bands can go all the way to 55 dBm. That is uh, roughly about 16 times more power that we're transmitting at versus a handset, which is power class three. So again, it's important that the test equipment is able to handle these high power, be able to have that dynamic range in there, and um, also make sure that it's not, the high transmissions do not, you know, adversely impact any of the components. Um, so again, we don't want to have separate hardware for testing PC power class one devices versus power class three devices. So those, that's, those are some additional challenges um, and then I wanted to bring you guys um, on to the concept of OTA testing, near field versus far field, right? So as we go into millimeter wave, it becomes necessary that we need to test over the air because first of all, your antenna array is really, really tiny. You could have an eight by four antenna, something on the order of, of three centimeters, and it may be difficult to connect a device to it. And even if you're able to connect a cable to the device, uh, to that antenna port, the, the loss, the propagation loss would be too high uh, to do any kind of good measurements, right? So OTA testing is important. Um, now, OTA testing is divided into near field and far field. And within near field, you have a reactive, far, near, reactive near field as well as you have a radiative near field, right? So ideally, we want to test what we're, what we're seeing is uh, measurement point C and measurement point D, which are called your um, measurement points in the far field area. And those are kind of dictated by um, the number of uh, how far you are from the antenna aperture over here. So antenna aperture is what we call D, uppercase D, divided by the frequency. So as your frequency goes down, 
your distance becomes larger, uh, but you got to make sure you got to take into account that when you have larger distances, your surface area will become smaller at high frequencies. So you could pack a lot more antennas, so your D may become smaller with, with respect to that. So again, far field testing is important. Um, and then the other part is what we call near field radiative testing, which is given by the formula, um, you know, R is the distance from the antenna aperture to your measurement point, which is given by 0.62 uh, root of D cube by lambda. So it's, uh, it's pretty much uh, directly proportional to the frequency. Um, and what I'm showing you down here are, are three different solutions that Enritsu has uh, with respect to testing in the near field, whereby you have a shield box. Key thing is you're testing in the near field radiative region, not in the reactive region, because if, you, if you're testing in the reactive region, like uh, measurement point A, you will have a lot of distortion. You cannot demodulate the signal properly. Um, so ideally, we want to test in the far field area, and the far field can be indirect far field or it can be direct far field. So there are two solutions that we're showing here um, that cater to that. Uh, both uh, the, what you see on the right is a direct far field chamber. What you see in the center is a CATR indirect far field chamber or what we call uh, compact antenna test range. All right, so a few of the items that I wanted to mention over here is uh, the fact that uh, there are, one, one chamber doesn't fit everything, right? So it's important that the cost is a very important factor. Uh, we want to make sure that we are able to cater to the cost uh, for our customers in general, right? So if you look at it from a 3GPP perspective, what we have here is an indirect far field cathode chamber whereby you have a parabolic reflector, you have a feed antenna, it's going to send signals over here. Uh, those are going to be uh, spherical waves and those become parallel waves that they get reflected from the CATR chamber. And that's one of the enriched chambers over here. So we have a, uh, this can cater to your transceiver testing as well as your performance testing and your RNM testing whereby your angular arrival is equal to one. That's one way. Uh, now comes the point now, how do you test multiple angular arrivals, right? So there is a solution, which is a very easy solution is to do, um, I have a 3D impact chamber, which is a direct far field solution. So for RRM testing, the, the, the essence of RRM testing is to be able to test with at least two angular arrivals, um, and, the, and the angle can be 30, 60, 90, 120, and 150 degrees, right? So simple solution, but very expensive and very costly solution is to have a 3D impact chamber. Now this is direct far field, so your far field distance is pretty high. The reason why we use indirect far field is to reduce the amount of far field distance. Uh, but this is gonna be a very expensive solution, plus you have, a customer would not want to use uh, two different solutions. One for you know, TRX performance testing, and other for RRM angle of arrival equal greater than one, right? This is gonna be a very expensive solution. Uh, another solution, which is also expensive, is have a mixture of what we call indirect far field um, and indirect far field. So you have multiple CATR uh, lenses, you have multiple uh, CATR reflectors that you can see spaced out at different angles. Again, this is gonna be not as big a solution as what we have in MPAC, but it's gonna be fairly expensive because you're gonna require to have multiple uh, CATR reflectors over here. That's the other option. What Enritsu has, or what we have proposed, is to have one solution to be able to use the same CATR chamber we have for um, RRM angle of arrival greater than one testing as well. And how do we accomplish that? Accomplish, accomplishing this is gonna be a mixture of IFS, which is indirect far field that you see over here, um, as well as direct far field. So you can have some antennas on top, which can move with time. So you can have that right angle with this parabolic reflector. And that way you can retrofit your existing CATR chamber um, to be able to do all the conformance testing, your TRX testing, your performance testing, your RRM testing for angle of arrival equal to one, as well as angle of arrival equal to two. So that's, that's a challenge. Um, and Enritsu is marching forward with it to meet that challenge to have uh, one sort of chamber for our conformance uh, testing customers. All right, um, other, other items that we have that we need to look at is what we call uh, testing time. So testing time is a big, big problem. Um, we need to reduce the amount of time it takes to test a device. And when we have um, FR2, that testing time does not become smaller and the testing time keeps on increasing. 
Um, and, and the reason for that is it's pretty much, you know, um, you have to take measurements at different grid points. Uh, and you do a baseline beam peak search. So you normally try to search for the peak angle where you have the highest EIRP strength, effective isotropic radiated power. Um, and then you lock your beam and do all your measurements. But to do that spherical scan to find that, it takes a long time. And it all depends on how, how large your beam is, um, um, what, what your angle of the beam is as well, um, and, the, the, and how fine it is. So the more the grid points, the longer it's going to take. So there are different, different ways implemented, and it's was implemented, again, taken from specifications, um, on how to reduce the test times. And one way is what we call coarse and fine scan. So what we can see over here is you, we try to determine uh, initially uh, where uh, the high beam peak is, right? So if you look at the blue, purple, and uh, magenta colors, it doesn't make sense to do a scan in an area whereby, whereby you have a, a very low um, signal strength, right? So you would want to focus, instead of doing entire sphere, you would want to focus in an area whereby it's, uh, you're more probable to have your peak search. So you do what we call core scans. Core scans are much more geographically dispersed. You don't do, and then once you have found that area, what you see on the right side is, okay, I have an area that certain phi and theta, I'm, I'm going to be getting my, my peak beam, and then you do fine scan between that. So you don't really have to measure all the points, and that reduces testing, test time, right? The other part, what we can do is what we call constant step size and constant density. So constant step size is a way whereby your grid type, you know, you have your measurement points that are evenly distributed on the surface of a sphere, right? So you can see it's going, changing by every 15 degrees. So you probably have about 256 different points over here. The other option is constant density, right? As I said, constant density is you have your measurement points that are, that are evenly distributed on the surface. In constant step size, they are not evenly distributed, but they are at regular step intervals. So constant density would take less number of points and you can save your spherical scan time, which is the bulk of the time it takes to do these uh, frequency range two tests, right? So that's another thing implemented. So key, key takeaways, two methods of doing it. There are a lot of patented methods that we have introduced, but high level, which is available in the specifications in 38.810 are uh, coarse and fine scan and constant step size and constant density. Last but not the least, uh, just wanted to give you guys an overview of the different uh, areas of 5G. And Ritsu has been engaged in 5G for over three and a half years, I would say right now. And we play a, a key role uh, in different phases of testing, going from component testing all the way up to production testing, going through chipset R&D with the chipset vendors, as well as doing certification testing. So the key, the key item is the MT8000, which is our network emulator for 5G. It's reused in all of these different components over here. That's, that's the kind of the brain. Um, of uh, our test systems. So that being said, uh, I would say in summary, we talked about the, the spectrum utilization and the landscape, and then we talked about the evolution of 5G features going from release 15 to release 17 and some of the test challenges um, and solutions. So uh, again, it's a lot of stuff in an hour, but um, or I would say less than an hour, but I would uh, certainly welcome any questions and as I said, if we can answer any questions um, due, due to the time constraint, uh, I'll be happy to take them offline. Uh, my email address is right below there. Um, and you can certainly feel free to send me an email with any sort of question. I'll try my best to respond back. Again, thanks very much for your patience and your time and your dedication. Thank you very much, Adnan. Um, I do have a couple questions that we have uh, time for. So the first one is kind of lengthy, is um, regarding the test chamber. It is my understanding you need to calibrate the device in the chamber to get accurate measurement. The question is just one position for different bands. Also, how often do you need to adjust? Weekly, monthly, or yearly? Good question. Um, so basically, the calibration for these is done on an annual basis. And there is uh, 3GPP defines how uh, calibration portion as well as how the quiet zone, as you talked about different frequencies, right? So the, the chamber has to be characterized across different frequencies. And 
uh, 3GPP uh, specification 38.810 defines um, exactly, you know, at how many different, uh, so basically we take an antenna at different angles of phi and theta, we, do, we take it at seven different points and we go around five different phi and five different thetas at different frequency ranges. And we, we, we need to, correct, the main thing is to characterize the quiet zone. You wanna make sure we're getting the right quiet zone and that the amplitude and phase are within a certain amount of measurement uncertainty in that specific quiet zone. So again, it's, it's done on, on a yearly basis. It done, it's uh, the characterization, but uh, the calibration is on the yearly basis. Characterization happens once. And after that you have what we call uh, the calibration again on an annual basis. 